Okay, I don't know if this qualifies as an emergency pod. We're just moving the pod up a day. Yeah, I think the technicality is if we add a pod, it becomes an emergency pod. If we just move it, technically it's not. But you know what? If you my Twitter feed is entirely people celebrating this move and demanding a podcast today. So here we are. We you ask and we we got you covered. If nothing else, an expedited Eagle Eye podcast with Ruben Frank. I'm Dave Zangaro. We needed to do this. We'll get into some other stuff later, but the big news on Wednesday, the Eagles, in my estimation, filled their biggest hole at cornerback by signing James Bradbury. One year deal, you know, as soon as the Giants released him, it just made so much sense. And, uh, you know, even before they released him, they were trying to trade him. Um, how he played it right. He didn't have to give up anything um, to, to get him. It's it's riskier to let a guy hit free agency than, than make a trade. Uh, but I, I think he felt confident um, he was going to be able to pull it off. And, and he did. One year deal, uh, a lot of money, $10 million, uh, relatively. Um, but this is a guy who uh, did not play as well last year as he did in his Pro Bowl season in 2020, but he's still so much better than what they had, so much better than their other options at that position. And the way I look at it, Dave, the biggest thing is you're not signing him to be CB1. If you were, then maybe you'd be like, you know, I'm not sure he's he's that player right now. But uh, in this role as CB2 across from Slay, you're getting – uh, you're getting a really good, you know, a top five CB2, I would think, top five to top eight CB2. And a guy who can go out there, he's not going to have to play against uh, the the other team's top receiver because Slay's going to shut that guy down. He's going to get a lot of balls thrown his way. And, uh, yeah, I agree. I mean, they, they filled out every other need other than safety, which they might tell you is not a need, um, but it's something they had to do and, and how he did it. Yeah, and it's not just an upgrade on what they had right now. It's an upgrade on Steve Nelson, too. And that's not – I'm not saying he was bad by any means last year. Steve Nelson was solid in in his action last year, but James Bradbury is just a better player. And I know he had a down year last year, and I think that's important to remember. It's not like he's coming off that Pro Bowl season. He didn't play as well last year, but you're right. He's going into a situation where he doesn't have to be the top guy, and he's going into a scheme that – should probably help him out quite a bit. You're right. Like as soon as we heard the Giants were releasing it, everyone went, "Well, this makes a lot of sense," and it did. It just the the money had to line up, and the contract. We'll, we'll get the exact numbers, but it sounds like it's worth up to ten million dollars. That's what's being reported. So it's really less than that, with a chance to earn some extra money. I think ESPN reported seven point five million guaranteed. And then the, the extra two and a half is incentive, either team or or individual. But that's about a going rate is for yeah. a, a high quality corner in this league. And it's a one year thing. So it's not like they're tied into it. And if he leaves next year as a free agent, we'll see how much the Eagles are spending. But it could help them in the compensatory pick formula, too. Yeah, and Howie's got a lot of mileage out of these one-year deals, and you basically give the guy a chance. I'm sure Bradbury was looking for a long-term deal, and uh, it wasn't coming, and Howie just, you know, he, he's done this with a bunch of guys, you, you, and he gives them the flexibility. If you really like the guy, if you want to keep him, you can sign him again if he wants to be here, if the money's right. And if it doesn't work out, you know, you don't have this long-term obligation and dead money and, you know, and a big veteran headache on your hands. Um, ideally, you want guys on long-term deals so they can kind of grow with the with the off, with the the off defense or the offense, whatever it may be. But tell you what, having having James Bradbury for one year, sure better than having him uh, not at all. And, you know, and then it gives you a chance maybe next year to uh, to, to draft a corner early, which, which obviously they haven't done since 17. Um, to draft one in the, in the first couple rounds, so uh, gives them flexibility. Um, the, the really the whole the whole secondary has pretty much been one year deals. I mean, you know, Steve Nelson was a one year deal. Anthony Harris was a one year deal. Um, I, I think Steve Nelson was good last year, um, above average, not not a whole lot above average, but he was better than average. But James Bradbury has a chance to be. You're right, one level above that. Yeah, and the thing is, it how he's really pounced. And back-to-back years on guys getting released late. 
right. you know, you mentioned that Bradbury was probably looking for a long term deal. Maybe, but you know, it's at this time of the year, there aren't long term deals normally. Right. You know, it's he probably, you know, his agent was probably honest with him too and said, Hey, look, our best bet's probably going to be to sign a one year deal somewhere. You play really well. And then we figure out the long term stuff after the season. And that's kind of what Steve Nelson looked at it like last year too, because he got released late and it's, it's a good way for, for how to pounce on some guys are available. And, and we have to keep this in mind every March, like 17th, when we go, what the heck's he doing? He hasn't added anything yet. At this point, he deserves the benefit of the doubt when he, when he has positions of clear need and even through the draft, because we're sitting there at the draft going, how do they not draft the cornerback? How do they, like, how did they neglect this position? And I give him credit now because he didn't force anything. He waited it out, and he ended up getting a really good player. You think back, he's been patient at that position in general. Think back to when they got Darius Slay. Everyone wanted him to go out and get uh, Byron Jones. And the money got too high, and he said no. They waited. They traded for Slay, and they got a better player without the obvious way to do it. And He's done that with, with a few different positions, but really cornerback and, and receiver, we've seen it with A.J. Brown, just being creative in the ways to, to acquire these players. And, and this is some of it's luck. <laughs> you have to have a guy get released. And, there, you know, but he maybe he saw the writing on the wall with Bradbury. I'm sure he did. But, you know, I think I think secondary more than any position over the last several years, how he has filled late, you know, whether it's Corey Graham uh, and Darby. In the Super Bowl year, like you said, Steve Nelson was was a late signee. Uh, even a guy like Epps was in the middle of the season. Uh, you know, he's a, a waiver a waiver guy from the Vikings. Um, how how he's very good at I guess unconventional ways to acquire play, players, and he's he's really. Uh, but you're so right. I mean, there's always that initial panic when free agency, like the first 48 hours of free agency, comes and goes. But, I mean, if you look at – I mean, the, the three big pickups the Eagles had this year of veteran players, um, two of them came much – you know, a month after the initial free agency was over. And you look at um, A.J. Brown, who was a trade, and and now Bradbury, who was a free agent, late free agent. So um, it's hard to preach patience. It's hard to be patient when you see other teams grabbing these big-name guys. But uh, if you wait – and you're able to fill that need, you're getting better value almost every time. Yeah. I'm excited to see how Jonathan Gannon deploys these guys because last year it was pretty clear, like Slay deserves to be on the top corner or sorry, on the top receiver and travel with them, at least on the outside. I wonder if they'll do it as much with Bradbury, who like we, we both agree is a step up from Steve Nelson. I wonder if they kind of keep the sides this year. Yeah, it'd be interesting. It might depend on the team and and the, you know, the matchups. Um, if you have two kind of, if if a team's got a, a clear one and one and two, maybe he travels. If they got two guys who are about even, you know, maybe physically they're similar. Uh, maybe it it just pays to keep them on each side. But he's got that flexibility now. I was trying to think back to the last time the Eagles had two. You know, just two good cornerbacks, like two quality. And and look, Darby and Jalen Mills both played really well in 17. But, you know, Jalen Mills was was limited, and, and he gave everything he had. He still does. He'll give you everything he's got. But um, he was never an elite corner. He was an elite red zone corner, but uh, he was never an elite cornerback. Um, it's funny because the last time they had two Pro Bowl corners at the same time was DRC and Namdi. So I don't think they really qualify as a great tandem, but uh, it's been a while since they had two corners that you just felt good about. And, uh, you know, you felt like you had a a real chance to have some good matchups in the secondary. Yeah, and if if takeaways are going to be a big part of this defense, and they should be, that's kind of what separates good from great defenses. These two guys take the ball away. We're talking about Slay and, and Bradbury. And then Avante Maddox, that's the blessing of this move, and it was a blessing of Steve Nelson last year. It keeps Avante right where he belongs as the nickel corner, and he's one of the better ones in the league. And I, I don't think they would have played Avante outside, but if he was their best option, I, you know, I, it was in the back of my mind thinking, like, it, it, whatever it takes to avoid that, because it, it put him out of position, and it, 
I, I didn't want to see that again. So, and it hurt the slot too. It hurt the it it hurt two CB two. It hurts the slot. Yeah, yeah. But now those three corners, that's pretty good. That's really good. I mean, we can't lose sight of just how well Avante Maddox played in the slot last year. He was. Um, he was very, very good, very consistent, tough, physical, smart, instinctive. Um, and, uh, yeah, they, that position is lining up really well. What you just said, I, I just wanted to add something to it as far as the takeaways. I, I looked this up, and I thought I, I thought I typed it wrong in, in stat head. You know, um, uh, Bradbury's got 10 picks over the last three seasons, including his last season in uh, – where was he, Carolina before the Giants? Yeah. Those last three years, he's got 10 picks. And I looked up who's got the most interceptions on the Eagles over the last three years. And it's Rodney McLeod with five. And I thought I only typed in like one year as opposed to like combined three years. Combined three years. He's got five. Slay's got four. Um, and and then it goes down to like – this is, you know, over the last three years. Then it goes down to like Sidney Jones with three. You know, I mean, that's what we're looking at. So he's got twice as many picks over the last three years as anybody uh, on the Eagles has had. And and that's big. I mean, that's, you know, they just haven't had playmakers back there. Slay is, you know, Slay showed what kind of playmaker he is last year. Now you got two guys like that. He's got 15 picks as a pro. Uh, so, you know, he's a consistent, you know, three, four interception guy a year. And, and you know, now he's going to be, Teams are going to throw at him. I mean, teams don't want to throw at Slay. So there's going to be a lot of balls coming his way, and he's going to have some opportunities to get some hands on some footballs. You know what I can't wait to watch? Training camp battles. Yeah. Think about it. Like, you're going to have the receiver. You're going to have Devontae Smith, A.J. Brown, Quez Watkins going against, and when they go ones-ones, you're going to have Bradbury, Slay, and Maddox. When's the last time this team had good receivers and good cornerbacks? 1886. Yeah, it's unbelievable. Did you like the stat that I pulled up on uh on Bradbury and Slay? Yeah, well, the the uh, yeah, give, share that one. This is great. Yeah, I, I like quadruple checked it. Uh, since uh, Bradbury entered the league, there are only two cornerbacks to have 15 plus interceptions and 80 plus passes defensed or or pass breakups, and they're on this team. It's Slay and Bradbury, which some of that's luck, but it's also ball skills and they have it yeah yeah you're right um in all honesty i can't remember a time the eagles had and you can even i would include maddox in this in i mean back in the day the third corner the slot wasn't really a starter position like he is mm -hmm. now his teams weren't playing three wides like they do now but even just one and two i can't tell you a time they had like eric allen never had an elite corner uh you know next across from him uh, you know, the good corners. I mean, Troy Vincent and Bobby Taylor is probably the last last time you had two. Would you throw Lito and Sheldon there? Yeah, Lito and Sheldon, sure. Yeah. Um, they, they, they had pretty good run. And and they were, you know, they were so different players. And I, that's what I loved about it. Lito was jumping routes and taking risks and taking chances. And Sheldon was just so solid and, uh, you know, good run defender. So, yeah, that was, that was a good tandem. But – uh, I'm getting an idea in my mind here. The top, the, the do a, a piece on the top cornerback combos in Eagles history. Um, too bad Ray. We, we, too bad. We, I don't have Ray on the line here. I could just ask him what he thinks. Let's start, you know, you know <laughs> for, for the gift, you know, for the, the tandems before like 1985. So, um, yeah, it's uh, it's exciting. I mean, they've they've addressed. Every major need, and you could say safety, but I mean, going into the offseason, corner, wide receiver, and edge rusher, and and here we are. I mean, how he's how he's really crushed this offseason. All right, well, let's talk about the safety position then, because that's if you're looking at the biggest holes on the roster after the addition of Bradbury, you'd probably say safety because they brought Anthony Harris back, but they let Rodney McLeod go, and now Marcus Epps, who played well in a relatively limited role last year is presumably the starter now they could add at some point we've seen like obviously with bradbury they can add whenever they want but how would you feel if they go into the season with marcus epps as one of the starting safeties well you know i wrote a piece on on how he's off season and and my my last line was something like you know if your biggest concern on the roster is whether marcus epps can handle full-time load of safety you're you're in pretty good shape and 
I, you know, I think at worst he's he's okay. I, I think at best if he can play the way he did, and you asked him this today, if he can play, if he can take what he did last year and add, you know, twenty five to thirty snaps a game and play at that same level, then you've got something. And and uh, you know he's um, he's got a chance to be a, a pretty good player. But you know that's a jump that some people don't make from from being a good part time guy you know, to a, a really good full-time guy. You know, some guys just have that point of diminishing returns where the more they play, you know, they le- the less they're going to give you, the less consistent or efficient they're going to be. So he's got to answer that. Um, but at least you have two guys that have – I mean, he started eight games in the league over the last two years, and he's he's been fine. Um, Anthony Harris, I'm, I'm not a huge fan of Anthony Harris, but he started games in the league – um, he's, you know, so you have two guys at worst who are okay starters, um, at worst. I think Epps has a chance to be, to be better than that, but you know, at corner, you know, I, I think the need was so much more pressing. No, no pun intended at, at receiver. It was so much more pressing at, at edge rusher. Um, you know, those are, though, first of all, those are more important positions, uh, than, than safety, not that safety is not important, but, um, they also just didn't have. They didn't have average guys, you know. They so now at safety, that's the one area where you're like, well, we might be average there. I mean, every team's got that that spot, you know. You look at depth charts around the league; every team's got that spot where, you know, they've got question marks. They've got guys who aren't uh, established NFL starters and, and have to prove themselves. But um, I think Epps has a chance to be a pretty good player, and I'm certainly not going to be losing any sleep over. You know they they've improved in so many areas that I think if he, if you bring back Epson and Anthony Harris you can still win a lot of games. Yeah, I think so. And the way I look at Epps is he basically forced his way into action last year, and part of that was because the guys in front of him weren't playing particularly well, but part of it was that he was. And it's it's always a tough thing to project someone's role from being a part time player to a full time player. Are they going to be able to be? as effective as they were before. And I I don't know whether or not he will be, but the early signs, at least from what we saw last year, he's gotten better. He's a pretty decent player. And I'm kind of with you. I don't think it's a huge deal. And now the the depth at that position worries you a little bit because after him, you have Kayvon Wallace, Jared Maiden, Andre Sachere, and Reed Blankenship. But, uh, and, and so maybe they want to add just to, have some more depth, but I think they'll be okay with Marcus Epps. And I don't think it's like the long-term fix they wanted, and maybe they'll still find a way to to add more talent. I mean, everyone – I've already seen a bunch of people on Twitter tell me Jesse Bates is the answer because it, things aren't going well with him in Cincinnati. But, I mean, that let's pump the brakes on that a little bit because I think they could get by with Marcus Epps. That's my gut feeling. And uh, honestly, I like the way he played last year. Uh, I, you know, that's why I think he de- deserves this chance. I mean, he's a great story because, what was he, a six-round pick of the Vikings? Mm-hmm. Um, they cut him in the middle of the 19 season? No, the 20, 20 season. This is his third year here. Middle of the 20 season, the Eagles claimed him and, you know, just kind of worked him in, taught him everything. He played special teams from the start. He was just like a fringe guy. Um, and I think you put it really well. He worked his way, you know, he, he forced, he forced them to make this decision by playing really well. Whenever he got a chance, he just got more and more playing time. And, uh, even the difference between him last year and, and 2020, when he actually started five games, uh, I thought it was significant. I thought he played significantly better, uh, last year and he's, you know, he's very active. Um, he's around the ball. Uh, he's a pretty physical guy. Um, he's never really out of place. So I, I really think he's got a shot. And um, I don't really anticipate a, a big move at safety. I, I know, first of all, I, you know, there's there's not unlimited cap money to go around. And how he's, how he's been spending some. And I'll tell you what, you know, no Eagles fan should ever worry about Howie in the cap because he finds a way. I mean, it's really amazing. Like to go from – well, we're in such big cap trouble to like just signing these guys and giving out these big contracts. Um, nobody does it better than Howie, but um, yeah, I, I like where they are. And, and, you know, Harris is Harris. I, I think the improved linebacker and D line will help the entire secondary. And look, you've got 
you got Avante and Bradbury and Slay a corner. Um, you know, you're you're got a pretty good secondary as it stands right now. Yeah, and then you think about just the amount of pieces they've added on defense in the last two months. Yeah, really. I mean, it started with Hassan Reddick, then you had Kaiser White, and then you had the draft and Jordan Davis and the Kobe Dean, and now you add Bradbury. I those are five players who are going to play an awful lot this year. Many of them starters. This defense has the pieces now to be much better than it was last year. Yeah, and you think about, you know, they they moved on from from Alex Singleton, who was okay, but not not better than that. They moved on from Rodney McLeod, who played pretty well down the stretch, but again, uh, you know, where was he going from there at this point in his career? He moved on from Stephen Nelson and got somebody better. Um, moved on from Jannard Avery, replaced him with. You know, pretty much at Sam with with a guy who's going to get you ten to twelve sacks. You would hope. Um, so, you know, they let some guys go who are okay, but they're you know, I think Howie's thing was we're, they're okay, but they're just not good enough. We got to be better. And I think that's the that's the most impressive thing about this off season is, you know, you come out of last year. I mean, they were a top ten defense. They were. They just were. I mean, that's what the numbers say. And going into the Dallas game, at least they were top ten defense. And um, first year under Gannon and it would have been easy to say, you know what, just run it back with some of these same guys. And, you know, they weren't content to do that. And they really, how he really reshaped this defense. Uh, like you said, I mean, um, Jordan Davis is going to be, I mean, he, he's the heir apparent to Fletcher, uh, you know, the Kobe Dean and cause your white give you the best two best tandem of linebackers they've had in, in quite some time. And and now you have a Pro Bowl cornerback that you just added. I mean, every every level of this defense has gotten better. And I, you know, I think it's gonna, I think we'll really get an idea of what Jonathan Gannon is as a as a play caller and as a defensive coach. Because last year, and I, I said it a hundred times, the problem wasn't his coaching as much as it was. It was early. I think it, it was he was too passive early. Uh, but he just didn't have the people to to play what he wanted to play. Now he's got him. There's no excuses. So he's he's got the personnel to be aggressive, uh, to to go after people, and and to uh, you know to to really deploy these resources in a much much better way and, and more effective way, uh, more aggressive way than last year. I think we'll you know we'll learn a lot about Gannon uh, with what he does with all these new pieces combined with the the good pieces they have coming back. Yeah, and really it's Gannon and Sirianni because they they just they're a better team right now than they were last year. On paper, they're they're just a flat out better football team, based on who they have on the roster. So, it's time to really find out what they want to do offensively and defensively, and it, it comes down to those two guys, Sirianni and Gannon. And I'm with you on Gannon. I I didn't like a lot of what he did last year, and I was critical when they were going super passive because it was like he's going against these great quarterbacks, and he's trying not to get beat over the top, but they were killing him in other ways, and it basically felt like he was picking the way they were going to lose. You know, they could have lost a different way, but he picked this way for them to lose. This year, I mean, they should have a chance in every game. There's not one game on that schedule you say. You know, last year there were games like that. Right. There were. There were games you went, how are they going to win this? Including the Tampa playoff game. Sure, sure. Look at that schedule. Are there any games like that to you? Oh, uh, it's a good point. Um, you know, there's, I mean, certainly like a- a- Arizona, it looks like an awfully tough game, but no chance. I wouldn't say that. Yeah. And, you know, they also don't play the level of quarterbacks this year that they played last. They faced some good ones, but, you know, nothing like that murderer's row they had in, yeah. you know, September. I mean, this year they play, they play Aaron Rodgers, who's obviously at the top. But then, I mean, the drop off at Kyler Murray, you know, I mean, Matt Ryan is on the list of the best quarterbacks they'll face this year. He might have been on the list of the worst quarterbacks they faced last year. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I mean, I'm not a big Matt Ryan fan. I think he's kind of out of gas. So um, I'll take that matchup if I'm ra- if I'm ranking the quarterbacks they're facing. I mean, it's – and again, I mean, if you're going to be a really good defense, then you should be able to go out against Pat Mahomes and Tom Brady and Derek Carr and, and Dak and, and acquit yourself well. And I think they'll have a chance to do that when they do play an elite quarterback. That'll be the real test. But yeah, there aren't a lot of games where 
you're thinking this defense is going to get shredded. I mean, this is a different, you know, last year's defense just doesn't exist anymore. I mean, this is, they turned over half the personnel on it. Mm-hmm. So uh, it's, there's, there's no reason to think it's not going to be dramatically better. They better are they, in, are they just in full go for it mode? Seems that way. It seems that way. It seems like they say, Hey, we have a quarterback. We think we can win with, and he's cheap right now. Let's go for it. That's what this off season shows me. Yeah, I agree. And Howie's always been clear about the advantage that you have with a with a, a cheap quarterback, and uh, you know, a, a second round pick playing on his on his rookie deal. You can't get much cheaper than that as a quarterback, uh, unless you you know, unless you're going with an undrafted guy or something. You're just not going to find that, and that just affords you like another. That's like another twenty million in cap money. You know, more or more easier, depending on who the guy is. Yeah, it could be you know twenty or thirty million um, extra money that you have to spend because you've got a cheap quarterback. And when you have that, you got to take advantage of it. If if you know the the perfect combination is a cheap quarterback and a and a great supporting cast. And you know, I think there's a few teams in the NFC that I mean. If I'm ranking the NFC right now, there's not a lot of teams I'd put ahead of the Eagles, honestly. Packers, 49ers, um, there's not a ton. Not a ton of teams. How about probably, in division? Probably Tampa. Um, I think they've caught the Cowboys. The Cowboys on paper have gotten worse, I think. I, think I feel like they've caught the Cowboys. I feel they like – Two receivers, they lost Hardy – I say Hardy, all right, Gregory. Um, th- yeah. They lost two offensive linemen. I mean, yeah, it's not great. What's yeah. going on down there? I mean, honestly, they've got a better quarterback. Uh, I mean, I think he's you know love him or hate him, he's one. Of, he's a top ten quarterback, and they've got a you know they have not played well against him. They have not played well against the Cowboys, and uh, that's the next step for this team is is to go down to go down to. AT&T Stadium and and win a road game against the Cowboys. They've got to do that to win this division, and they got to win the division to make any kind of serious run at something, because uh, your odds of doing it as a as a wild card are just always going to be slim. Really, your odds as a number two seed now are just aren't that great. Um, you know, so uh, you know the, the number one seed has to be the goal. But um, I put them ahead of the Cowboys. I I really do at this point. Uh, they've gone in one direction. The Cowboys have gone in another. Just got to get past that mental thing of we can't beat the Cowboys and and go do it. Yeah. Uh, let's move on a little bit. Earlier this week, we found out they're going to Miami for joint practices, which means they're not going to spend a lot of time at the Novacare Complex in August because uh, before the Week Two preseason game, they'll be in Cleveland for joint practices, and then the very next week, heading to Miami. Now we we know. Nick Sirianni really values these joint practices. What do you think about this, though? Because this is different than doing them at home and then in Florham Park. This is you're flying your team all over the country to get these joint practices now. Yeah, but I mean they're making those trips anyway for preseason games, so uh, may as well go early and practice a couple of days. I mean he's been clear. I mean especially after the Jets. The Jets session last year. I think the first one was the Patriots, I believe, which was the one that was here. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, he he was so effusive in his in his praise of how much those floor and park practices meant as far as player evaluations and as far as the team just getting better. And they've he's pretty obvious now that the joint practices in his mind and the coaching staff's mind have supplanted the preseason games when it comes to preparing the team and evaluating players. I mean, you're just not going to see many starters in the in the in the preseason games because they're gonna they're gonna get um, they're gonna get the evaluations they need and uh, you know in the practices and uh, you know I forget who it was who came over and just told us that one of the I think we were in Florida Park that the real value is that you can do anything you want in these practices because other teams aren't seeing what you're doing you know they other teams can't come and film these practices. Uh, even though fans are there, you know, you can't be a scout for the, um, you know, a team that the Eagles play. You can't be a scout for the the, the, the Cowboys and show up in Florham Park and videotape these practices. So you can run the stuff that you're going to run during the season 
and really prepare for the season. See how Within you're... reason. Within reason, yeah. Because that some of these coaches talk, and they know that too. Yeah, that's true. That's true. But um, you can certainly run a lot more than you would run in a preseason game where you're just going totally vanilla. They're not vanilla in in these practices. And, um, you know, I think, I think Nick talked about that. He said there's kind of an understanding between the two coaches to not really – you know, go to other coaches and, and say, look, this is what they were doing. I, it probably happens. Uh, but um, the but value. You know, the, you, but the coaching trees aren't hidden either. Like, you know. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, by, by the same token, I think, I think it's clear the value. Uh, last year was the first time they ever did two joint practices. Um, Andy Reid hated joint practices. I don't think they ever did them under Andy, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. He just didn't like them. He's just like, you know, I just want to keep my guys here. And, uh, you know, he was afraid that, the, you know, things would get too spirited. There'd be injuries, um, you know, fights. And he just wanted to stay away from that. Um, but, you know, Doug Doug got back to – or Chip got back to doing them. Uh, and then, you know, Doug did them. And then, you know, Nick's doing them twice, which Belichick's always done too. Um, and it's, it's a big part of their evaluation now. It's a lot of running around. I mean, they're going to – I think they have an extra day between that. They have an extra day between the the Cleveland game and the Miami game. I think they're mm-hmm. eight days apart, maybe. So they would come home for a couple of days and then just head back down there. It'll be interesting to see Tua and and Jalen on on uh, on the same field for the first time in, in a little while. Um, but it'll be yeah, Waddle not, and Devonte Smith too. Uh, yeah, I mean it's just going to be a it's just going to be an, an Alabama reunion there. And we'll get to see Duke Riley. Our old friend Duke Riley would be down there, uh, but uh, yeah, and they're fun. I mean, they're fun to they're fun to watch. I mean, they're. I mean, those Jets practices were really good. I mean, that was really fun fun football, uh, really high level work that they got there. And it's not surprising he wants to do two of them. But yeah, for for two weeks they're not going to be at the Novacare, and and uh, and we won't either. Yeah, they're never going back to caring about the preseason. No, not under think, Sirianni, at least. Yeah, no, well, that's that's and you know you kind of hire John Harbaugh, they'll care. But if, <laughs> if it's Sirianni, it's, right. yeah, he's got his winning streak to protect. Yeah, uh, what is it, like sixteen straight preseason games. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, that's I, I love Harbs, but that's a little embarrassing. I mean, that the team starts tweeting about their preseason winning streak. You know, that's I don't think that's anything to really be proud of. But I mean, if the Ravens played the Eagles in a preseason game, which they usually do, they have in the last couple of years, but it might be 50 nothing. You have one coach who's like, you know, Lamar Jackson's in there in the fourth quarter. The other team, you know, Reed Sinette's playing the whole game. Yeah. Nick's got his car started in the parking lot. <laughs> in the fourth quarter. But uh, yeah, it's, it's uh, fun though. And and it, the competition is really good. And the, the coaches we've talked to that have really like them basically say like we get game situations but we get to control them if we want to see how our team can handle a goal line we don't have to wait for us to drive down the field 100 yards we can say all right goal line and then they're in that situation so i guess part of it is like you don't have a flow of a game to get used to but these guys have played football they know the flow of the game and they can put them like they want to see two minute no here's a two minute drill so it's it's, it's a little bit of like acting in a way, you have to kind of get in the mindset of, no, this is the situation. It's game-like. And having another team there helps with that because it becomes very competitive. And I don't even think they went live at all with a team last year. Did they They go live and either uh, tackle to the ground in either of those joint practice sessions? I don't think they did. I think it was mostly just thud. It was mostly thud. I don't remember anything live, but it was very high level. You know, they were getting after it. And, and that was the big question for us was after watching that and after watching all the light practices and then them not really going full bore in the preseason games, you wondered how do they handle the first time they're in live game action. And they were fine. So, I mean, I think part of that, like I think their success last year was pretty vindicating for Nick and his coaching staff about how they handled it. Yeah, I would agree. And they stayed healthy. And, yeah. you know, it all adds up. I mean, you're getting the work in, you're getting the mental reps, you're getting the, uh, you're getting physical reps. You're just not as at as much risk physically. Uh, you're protected to guys. It makes for some awful preseason games and you feel bad for the fans who've paid for those, those tickets and have to sit through those games that are just, 
I mean, I enjoy them because I like seeing the young guys out there. But if I was a fan sitting in the stands paying good money for that, I would not be super happy. Yeah. Um, and I think there are some players who benefit more from live game action. Do you agree with that? So I like I think a guy like TJ Edwards, because so much of his game is the type of physicality like the other linebackers on this team, for instance, don't have. That I I think sometimes it's just a little tough for some players to really show their skill set in a practice setting. But overall, I think the the advantages that way the the disadvantages. Yeah, no doubt. Yeah. All right. The last thing we have here. We have enough time for it. Uh, I got the full numbers for the undrafted rookies. So uh, every year, basically all these undrafted rookies get the same base level contracts. What differentiates them, the guaranteed money and the signing bonuses. So once we get these real numbers, it can kind of change the way we know how the Eagles think about these players. So last year, Jack Stoll got the most guaranteed money. And guess which undrafted rookie played the most? It was Jack Stoll. 122,500, was it? Correct. Yeah. Uh, and then it, a few years ago, it was TJ Edwards. It was Nate Herbig, it, Sue Opeta. So the money can tell you an awful lot about what the Eagles think of these players. So uh, let's just go through them. And, and Rube, the numbers in general this year, insane. Astronomical. Just, I mean, we knew that the Eagles were going to value – after the draft because there were all these extra players that were draft eligible this year. But the way they spent was basically like them trying to add extra draft picks. Yeah. And I mean, I think there's some draft caliber players that they added who are going to, you know, a couple are going to have a chance to make the 53. And I, I would think a bunch of them will be on the practice squad and eventually get on the field and play. I mean, it's a pretty good group. And again, you know, when the draft ends, 32 teams are calling the same guys. So uh, if you want to have any chance of getting one of the top undrafted guys, it's going to take this year, it's going to take 200 grand just to get that guy to answer the phone. So, uh, it, you know, if you wanted to land some of these elite guys, relatively elite guys at the top undrafted players, uh, it you're going to have to, you're going to have to pay for it or they're just not going to consider coming here. So there's these bidding wars going on for all these guys and, uh, you know, it's a free-for-all. How we landed some pretty good ones. And it is really funny in a way, not like ha-ha funny, but just weird in a way that this bidding starts before the draft ends. Right. So they have, like, area scouts or position coaches starting to call. Like, maybe they were calling Kennedy Brooks in the seventh round saying, hey, basically saying, hey, we don't think we're going to get drafted, but we, we want we're not going to draft you, but we want you to come here. And that's the way this thing works. And with the numbers, so the, they have a, a pool, basically, of money that they can hand out in signing bonuses. That is restricted. But the amount of total guaranteed money is not restricted. And that's where we see the big discrepancy. This year, Rube, over $1.7 million in guaranteed money to these undrafted rookies. Last year, four hundred eighty grand. The year before, seven sixty four. So this is... A huge uptick. Yeah, and for a lot of guys, you know, there's a point in the draft where you stop hoping you got drafted because you have a chance to make more money undrafted than you do if you're a seventh round pick. Yeah. All right. Let's get into the names. And we knew this one a while ago. Carson Strong, uh, it's twenty thousand dollar signing bonus, three hundred and twenty thousand dollar guarantee. Obviously, questions about the knee and how healthy he's going to be in his career, but. This is a, a really talented young quarterback that they get in the building. Yeah, and it was going to take you know it was going to take a quarter of a million or more to to get him. Um, big arm. I mean, we know that. Uh, you would think at three hundred grand, he's going to be the number three quarterback on this team. Sorry, reads the net. Yeah, you would think so. As long as he's healthy, I, I don't see why not. Uh, the next one. Noah Ellis from Idaho, a guarantee of $250,000. He's hurt right now. He couldn't even participate in the rookie mini campus. So that tells you how much they really liked him. Yeah. Um, it's uh, it's a lot of money for and, – and, again, the guys that the guys that get cut out of this group, that money counts against the cap. I mean, that's dead money, even if they re-sign to the practice squad. Um 
that dead money doesn't go away just because you're on the practice squad. It's still there. So um, would have read Ellis's chances of making the team probably not great, but you know, you get him in the building and you know, you have first dibs on him most likely for the, for the practice squad. You could go anywhere, but uh, you know, it's, it's a, it's an investment. The last thing you want is to give a guy 200 grand and then you wave him at final cuts and he goes and signs with the commander's practice squad. That's, you know, then you have this dead money from this guy and you don't even have the player. Yeah, and it, it'll probably happen for a few of these guys. Yeah. I mean, just the, the nature of it. Uh, Noah Ellis, by the way, to me, is the one guy who signals most that we're going to see a lot of three, four looks from this team in a weird way. And, and I know that's strange because he's – follow my, my logic here. Hassan Reddick and, and Jordan Davis are just great players that you'd want no matter what. You can talk yourself – and the Jordan Davis being a zero tech and a four three, right? But the fact that they're adding a backup huge nose tackle and paying him all this money as an undrafted rookie kind of tells you that's a position on this defense, not just the player outweighing the positional value. That's a good theory. Um, I mean, I think it's pretty clear that that odd front is going to be at least some part of this some part of this defense, whether, you know, it's, it's base or not. I, I doubt it won't, it, it will be, but I think you see a lot of it. So yeah. Why would you bring in Ellis? If that's not the case, I think that's uh that makes sense. Yeah. The next one is Kennedy Brooks, the running back from Oklahoma, 240,000 guaranteed. I think he has a legitimate shot to make this roster. They have six running backs on the team right now. The top three are Miles Sanders, Boston Scott, and Kenny Gainwell. So you might have Jason Huntley and Brooks fighting for that last spot. They want a bigger running back. Brooks is on team, right? I would think so. Yeah. And, you know, Huntley did some, I mean, Huntley had a great training camp and then he was hurt, played a little bit at the end of the season, if I remember. Um, but uh, I would think Brooks has a legit shot. Uh, I mean, they've, they've kept, undrafted running backs josh adams led the team in rushing as a rookie i think yeah. Corey clement had a pretty had a pretty good game in minneapolis if i remember so uh i i, I would say he's got the inside track on that job at this point yeah. all right let me go through the cornerbacks here because that was a big talking point after uh they signed these guys mario goodrich is the top one at 217 guaranteed josh blackwell is next at 137.5 Josh Job 135. So altogether. Josh Blackwell's the Duke kid. Yeah. So those three all get significant guaranteed money. And now you have that's it's still a fascinating cornerback battle for those. There aren't that many roster spots. And Bradbury pushes everything down. Now you're gonna have like 12 <laughs> cornerbacks fighting for like two jobs. Yeah. Yeah. It's going to be fun to watch. And and I think Goodrich is probably, I mean, I don't know. I, he seems like he's the, the best out of that group, but they all have some traits. They're all kind of interesting guys. Uh, it's going to be fun to watch them all line up and I mean, they, they could all run. Um, you know, we'll see. It's going to be fun to watch. Yeah. A few offensive linemen, uh, Jared Williams from Miami, big tackle, 145 guaranteed. Josh Sills, 135. William Dunkel, 110. I think when they get to this point, they basically say, Hey, Stout, who do you want? We'll get them for you. I think they want to get to any point, they say that. <laughs> Probably true. <laughs> First round, second round. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, this is one we've talked about before. Britton Covey, 137.5, a signing bonus of 12.5. So not one of the top earners, but still significant money for a guy that I, I don't know how, if he's going to make the team or not, but with his ability as a returner, it's intriguing. Yeah, I think he's a guy who, with, with a good camp will, will have a shot because you know, that's certainly an area that they've got to get better in. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's one area where a rookie uh, can really make an impact without playing on offense or defense. You go out there and, in the return game and make an impact. So it'll be a good preseason for him, a good opportunity to, you know, have a long shot, but – realistic shot of making the team yeah and then the last two here reed blankenship uh a smaller guarantee than i expected only 55 grand and ali fayad the linebacker defensive end from western michigan no guaranteed money so um 
tells you it's probably an uphill battle for him. Yeah, yeah. But, I mean, it seems to me a couple of years ago, half the guys didn't get guaranteed money. Yeah. You know? So it's really – it's changed so much. Yeah. And I think so, it's a one-year thing. I think, you know, because COVID, so many guys went back and played another year, mm -hmm. and it just it just really made such a huge pool of draft-eligible players that it, it, you know, created this real – Top heavy group of of draftable type guys who just didn't get drafted because there were so many good players in the draft because of the same reason. So um, I think it's a one year thing to see these kind of bonuses and guaranteed money, but it's uh, certainly a really fascinating development. Yeah, and it's a lot of fun for me. I enjoy doing that. Every yeah, year. So too. thank you for indulging me there. <laughs> yeah. yeah, Dave loves his undrafted guys. I do. You got anything else? Where we wrap this up. No, no, it's uh, it was an exciting day. And, um, you know, it's been interesting to see the reaction and people, you know, I got so many tweets from people like, you know, I can't stand Howie, but man, he had a hell of an off season. You got to give him his props. And look, all these moves aren't going to work out. I mean, the, the odds are that not all these guys are going to be exactly what the Eagles hoped. Uh, but I feel like he's he's done the right thing every step of the way. He's done the thing that makes sense. He hasn't tried to be you know, too smart or too clever or too cute. He's just gone and pounced when a, a good player is available. And he's, um, I think he's handled the, 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 the off season really, really well. Yeah. I did want to mention, thank you for all the nice comments about our last pod with Ray. Uh, it was cool. We appreciated everyone uh, who mentioned that, how much they liked that. It was a lot of fun for us too. I think and we should, you, take the, we should take the Muhammad Ali story and just cut it and just play it like every few weeks. Just Yeah, it. I'm fine with that. I'll listen to it again. Yeah. All right. If you enjoyed the Eagle Eye podcast, please rate and subscribe wherever you get your pods. Those five star reviews really do help us. And if you're watching on YouTube, please click the like button and subscribe there as well. That's it for Rube. I'm Dave. We'll talk to you next time.